on this episode of Postcards. Crew Restaurant is an homage to uh, my family's heritage, from, in particular my mother's heritage. She's one of 10 children uh, born and raised in New Orleans. This is what I was taught. They said if you want to have good food, you put your whole finger in there, but don't put your feet. That's what my mother always taught me. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Juline on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 967cram.com. My mother has always cooked from when I could remember. I um, definitely learned to cook a lot from her. And then I got to watch my grandfather cook. We would spend um, parts of our summers in New Orleans visiting family. It's just always been something that I've always felt very um, comfortable doing. Even through high school, college, it was something I had, I've always loved. I'm going home, I'm going home, I'm going home, I'm going home. Growing up for me uh, in Bloomington, Minnesota was pretty typical, you know, same things most kids did. Um, the only difference is we were one of a few black families at that time in Bloomington. The population of students of color was about 3% in 1966 when we came up. And at the time my kids grew up, um, they had struggles in schools in terms of acceptance. You know, I um, was very active in the civil rights movement when I was in high school and college. And then when I came to Minnesota, I mean, I belong to the NAACP and other organizations, but um, once you get involved with raising a family, you're more concerned about how, how the world treats them. Going home, yes, I'm going home. Crew Restaurant is an homage to uh, my family's heritage. Um, in particular, my mother's heritage. She's one of 10 children uh, born and raised in New Orleans. My grandfather was a chef on a cargo ship that would leave from the port of New Orleans and go all around the world. And so some of these recipes here are uh, recipes that have been passed down um, from him to my mother, now to me. My dad, I remember after uh, he retired, when I would go visit, my dad would have something on the stove by 7 a.m. in the morning, whether it was red beans or spaghetti or gumbo or what have you, it would be on there simmering all day. And when the mailman came, he would offer him something to eat. When the garbage man came, he'd get something to eat. Neighbors would walk by, they'd all be invited to either uh, eat something that he had cooked or to drink some wine that he had uh, fermented in the attic. And that's what I remember, it's an act of love and just cooking was to, uh, was to be enjoyed by those who, you know, who came in contact with you. Hey. Hey, I got the sauce, got the sauce, yeah. Hey, I got the sauce, got the sauce, yeah. Hey.
My first job was at an apple orchard that was just right outside of our high school. Um, so that kind of sparked a passion for baking and knowledge on how many apple varieties they are. And then from that job, I went to a small bakery. And then at that point, I just knew that why waste any more time, go to a culinary school, get my degree and dive into the industry. Aaron Ray is my partner in life and in love. We met each other about a little over six years ago. In Flower and Flower, my goal was to incorporate edible flowers. I believe that plants in general, but also flowers, the sight of them just brings some sense of peace to your body and to your, to your day. So having that in there with the baked goods and the coffee, like those three things are the best way to wake up in the morning. Is We think that New Orleans is a great representation of the original melting pot of the United States. You find inspiration or ingredients from all over the world. Uh, because it was a port city too, it was kind of a gateway through the Mississippi to bring products northward. One of our favorite things to do when we go to New Orleans is go to Central Market and Grocery and have a muffaletta, which is a Sicilian um, sandwich brought originally from Sicily. We go across the street and eat beignets at Café du Monde. The beignet is essentially a fried bread, an Indian fried bread with uh, powdered sugar on it. I have a serious sweet tooth. I think I eat at least one cookie a day. And here, what I love most is the bread pudding for dessert. It was something that I grew up on but never liked, but then when I was introduced to Mateo's mom and her bread pudding, it just reawakened my soul for this weird dessert. And she was able to give me her secrets and it just opened my eyes to a whole nother level of what, what you can do in the pastry world, especially when you implement family recipes. When I go down there and I spend time with my family, we are a prototypical New Orleans family. Lots of get-togethers with family and friends around food, and that's kind of the essence of New Orleans, is there's music, there's food, and there's family. Those three are, are really big um, for us and our family, and also big here in crew. The flavors and tastes of New Orleans are really vast and vary. You know, it's been owned by several different countries before it was a part of the United States, and so there's a great Spanish influence, there's an Italian influence, there's a French influence, you've got a Native American influence, you've got an African influence. Depending on the dishes that you have, you'll have kind of a combination of those. Say for instance, our gumbo has sirloin in it, it's got chicken, it's got flour, it's got filet, which is a Native American, it's ground up sassafras root. Usually has the Trinity in it, uh, which is white onion, green bell pepper, and celery. He pretty much follows my recipes, although he tweaks them a little bit. He makes an excellent jambalaya. In fact, because he's so consistent in terms of the ingredients and how they put in, it always comes out the same. Mine, it varies. Our jambalaya has a really high tomato base to it. Uh, my grandfather was his first cooking experiences with an Italian family in their grocery store. And so he's got a lot of Italian influences in um, some of his cooking. His gumbo is much better than mine too. I think he, uh, he's found a different way of um, putting the roux in. I, I wait till it's cooked and stir it in and he um, mixes it in early with all of the, um, the meat and the veggies and so it um, tends to, to get more flavorful. So I think I'm gonna uh, adapt his weight from now on. My favorite thing on the menu is the red beans and rice. Simply because when we lived with his mom for a couple years, when we would get home from a long shift at work, you could smell the red beans and rice outside on the sidewalk as you walked up to the house and you knew that you were about to get a big, nice dinner and fall asleep really fast. That right there is kind of the smell of family for me and, and my new family, which is Mateo. Red beans and rice, we had about three days a week. My mom didn't work, there were seven of us at home, so I mean, we were probably considered poor. Probably on Friday, we'd, we'd um, do the traditional Catholic, no meat, um, but usually shrimp was really cheap. I remember 
the shrimp guy with his uh, wagon going through the neighborhood, you know, shrimp, three pounds for a dollar, little shrimp. So you could make a nice um, jambalaya or a gumbo at that point. But um, gumbo was for special occasions. Jambalaya was for special occasions too because of the, the cost involved. Yesterday's too late for haste. Tomorrow's just too far away. You want to make a major change. There's no perfect day than today. Starting this restaurant has always been a dream of mine. It is to keep our family history alive. My son works with us, um, and hopefully it's something I'll be able to pass on to him, and he can take the mantle, and I will continue these recipes down through him, um, and maybe some new ones that we may develop together. You know, hopefully we can teach, that's the biggest thing, is being able to teach other people in here how to do things inside of a restaurant correctly. And so I've got a couple high school students that work in the kitchen for us, and so they've expressed wanting to go to culinary school. I'm trying to give them as much of that uh, before they would make that decision as I can. Strong comeback for when I was in setback. Yeah. Tomorrow is a promise. Yeah. You can't put off your problems. Yeah. And if I'm jumping off the porch, I know my people following. Yeah. Such an eager beaver, but be a humble learner. Yeah. This is my moment. You gotta wait your turn, bro. I'm who the people yearn for. I'm from Minnesota. I grew up here. So my spiciest thing I ever ate was tacos and taco seasoning. You know, that's as crazy as my, my dinners got growing up. So being able to, to go down to New Orleans and, and be immersed in his family and the way that he was raised was probably the most special time for me during this journey because I got to see how he became the person that he is, even through his mom and then his uncle and aunts and everybody else, and then also see the culture in New Orleans and how that shapes the cuisine itself. And so being able to immerse ourselves in those trips I mean, the doors that we got from New Orleans is kind of a daily reminder for us to remember those times that we spent there, but also to remember the culture that's behind everything. To be about change, then you gotta be bold. Introduce solutions for the young and the old. Do more than you was told. Be lethal with your mind. Uplift them with your words and make them set the tone. And you walk in your truth. Nobody else is you. And when they say you can't be done, say you're living proof. And watch them all salute. I think these areas appeal to us, uh, one, because the access to land, that was a big, big thing for us, a big thing for a lot of folks who look like me, either uh, people of color, African Americans, um, access to land is, is something that um, is not necessarily that easily attainable. I think that was the linchpin for us to be able to do the, all the things that we wanted to do. Not only grow food for the restaurant, but also put programs in place for our nonprofit to show other kids who may be either from rural areas or urban areas about farming. Steve and Mary Peterson, the owners of the farm, um, it's where Steve grew up. They donated the land to us simply because they are in their retirement stages of life and they wanted to be a part of something bigger and better. Um, as far as helping kids heal through food and farming. We're hoping to have some technological pieces here, some Bluetooth soil monitoring equipment, um, helping them to be able to write maybe some code for that kind of thing so where it can give information back. You know what I mean? Like there's tons of things that kids who don't want to put their hands in the dirt, but they may be like technologically uh, advanced or that's what they want to get into there's a way for them to be in the agricultural business and, and hopefully being as, as on a smaller scale, they can help small scale farmers kind of regain their momentum that they need to have. The rural areas on that end appeal to us with the land, but it also appeals to me the conversations that we can have and hopefully the change that we can make in the kind of hearts and minds of people in rural area who kind of look at the city area from afar and maybe um, don't necessarily understand it or understand the people there. And so there's a judgment that gets put into place and we hopefully have created a space here that people can come in and um, have some of those conversations around food, um, which makes everything easier and also be able to sit across from people who may not look necessarily like them or have the same beliefs as them, but hopefully they'll be able to come to an understanding that they both want 
basically the same things in life. They're just looking at it through two different lenses. That's part of what our nonprofit organization is about. It's about bridging communities, both rural and urban, getting them together around food and farming to kind of show kids not only where the food comes from, but also what you can do with it through some entrepreneurial initiatives that we'd have, where kids would be able to create micro businesses around either food that they're growing that they can sell or products that they can make from the food that we would grow um, or the animals that we would grow. And so being able to give kids an opportunity to not only understand where their food and food systems come from, but how to make them be better. If they can go back and just for a minute think that my life could be bigger than what I think it was before I came here, like that's all that we want is for them to just dream just a little bit. I personally have grown immensely, but I think it wasn't until Mateo and I moved out here that we discovered what we can do together and and how harmonious not only our love for food but our love for each other and when you put them both together what we can create and I think that's the most exciting thing for me is waking up to the to my soulmate I think and finding each day a new recipe or a new uh, technique and remember that we still have forever to do this. And I think that's the most exciting thing that the journey has brought us because the journey will never end. You know, every day we're, we're growing and learning and, and that's the beauty in it. You can come out, give me a second. Oh yeah, I know. She's like, what mama, you gonna let me out? What mama? Hey, Lola, this way mama. This way. Let's go, yeah. No, no, no time to sit, let's go. I was born in Nakhon Phanom, Thailand. I don't remember much in Thailand because I was still young and when I came here, I was already five. Dad was in the service and we had the opportunity and I guess dad wanted to have a better life for us kids. At that time it was my brother and I and now there's three of us. My brother, my other brother, when they came to America, he was born. We, we came with nothing. We just came with the clothes on our backs and a paper that say, hey, you can enter now. <laughs> My mother did not want to work for nobody. <laughs> My mother wanted to use what she knew and what she knew was farming. Growing up, she didn't have much. You know, my, her parents were poor. And then when my father met my mother at that time, he was a soldier. My father was Laotian, my mother's Thai. And my grandmother at that time did not like my father because he was a different nationality than what she is. Believe it or not, my mother ran away with my father. Yeah. Oh, what did she do, mom? I ran away with a soldier. <laughs> And till she established herself, that's when she's, she wrote a letter to home and say, hey, I'm doing okay. And for a while they didn't, you know, they didn't have no contact. Fresno is what they call home and that's where they're still at. My mother's been farming since 1987 and she's still farming till today. And like the fruits and stuff like that, that we get here, she'll send for us seasonally. I will make sure you get some Fui Hui persimmons this year. Have you ever had those? Those are amazing. 
Oh, you guys, look at these, Data. My peppers. I am so proud of my peppers this year. Look at them. Wow. Yeah, I'm very proud of them. So this one, my mother gave me these silver bars and I don't know whether what these are, supposed to be some kind of protection in the Buddhist tradition. It has those, I think those are rhinos. But yeah, I got a pair of these from my mother. I don't know how old these are. My mother was a seamstress back at home, like in her country, back in her younger days. This is actually from real silk. And these are all hand, thread by thread. It has to be kind of, they call it tamsin. So I got one of these from my great aunt and then my mother gave me this one, right? But what happened was I went to the seamstress that's supposed to be a seamstress and charged ton too. And she ended up cutting this too short, but we know with me being a round girl, when it comes up, it's like this so then when I bend down guess what so yeah I just I hold on to it because my mother designed the whole thing so it's supposed to be like a costume type of thing like we wear to the temple and to like a wedding to a party when we go to the temple we always bow and Traditionally, the right way to bow at a temple is you put this down here. This is what I was told whether it's right or not. You put this down so that you can pray and go down with the fresh fabric type of thing. So this is what my great aunt made for my husband so that he can be part of the tradition when we go to the temple. Because every time we go home, yes, I take husband to the temple. When I met Lyndon, I was still in California. And I was going back and forth, and at that time I was like, okay, well I'm really interested in this guy. So I ended up renting a studio in Fargo. And from Fargo, it was like, hey, I have a house, you know, you wanna visit, you wanna go check it out. At that time, Lyndon didn't even think I wanted to be in a small town, because me coming from a big town, you know, didn't wanna be in a small town, I guess, you know, big town doesn't really outdo small town. It's always good in small town when everybody knows more about you than you do. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, when we had our wedding at the pantry, holy smokes, everybody knew about it. Everybody knew about it. I love it. People here in Madison anyways, you know, they're, they're, they're welcoming. Even my mother's like, oh my gosh. You know, I've never seen any community that is welcome as Madison. I am a waitress at the Pantry Cafe here in Madison, and I've been there for almost going on three years. <laughs> Me who likes to eat, I always bring things to kitchen tasks and see whether, you know, we can make things happen at the pantry and do different dishes and different things, you know, just to bring a different food to town so that people don't have to leave the small town just to get egg rolls and fried rice. That's how people know me. They call me the egg roll girl here. <laughs> we just got pork today, guys. We are having pork egg rolls. Okay, we're gonna add that in there, and then this is gonna be our mixture. It's simple, it's, you know, it's snack food for us because when we come home, you know, from school, mom always liked to have snacks for us because we can't go out and buy candies and chips 
So it's 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 pretty much simple. It's it's a lot of things are, you know, cabbage, carrots, bean thread noodles, your meat, and just fry them up, and that's it. My mother was hands-on. If you want to eat, you got to come in the kitchen. If you're not doing anything else, the least you could do is wash the vegetables or do the dishes. So with me, as you can see, there is nothing small about me. I still like to eat till today. So I was always in the kitchen. When I was, I want to say teenager, 14, 15, my mother was out at the farm. At that time, they were running uh, produce, shipping produce from Fresno to Los Angeles. And my job at home was to watch my two little brothers and made sure we call it dinner in California. You guys call it supper here in Minnesota. So to make sure that supper was on the table when my parents got home. And there was a lot of failures and a lot of, oh gosh, what did you put in there? So from there on, it was just mixing this and mixing that, and if it doesn't taste good, throw it away, try it over. This is what I was taught. They said if you want to have good food, you put your whole finger in there, but don't put your feet. That's what my mother always taught me. Anything that I guess I was raised on, it, it, it's like when I cook it myself, it brings back memories. It, 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 it brings me home, it brings me like, Oh yeah, I was in the kitchen with my mom when I was such and such age and we had so much fun cooking and like she would get on me because I would taste before I even, it, it's done. So I, I, I enjoy, I enjoy Thai food. Postcards is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Additional support provided by Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies. Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien on behalf of Shalom Hill Farms, a retreat and conference center in a prairie setting near Wyndham, Minnesota. On the web at shalomhillfarm.org. Alexandria, Minnesota, a year-round destination with hundreds of lakes, trails, and attractions for memorable vacations and events. More information at explorealex.com. The Lake Region Arts Council's Arts Calendar, an arts and cultural heritage funded digital calendar showcasing upcoming art events and opportunities for artists in West Central Minnesota. On the web at lrac4calendar.org. Playing today's new music plus your favorite hits, 96.7 Cram, online at 96.7cram.com. <laughs>